Hello, high level listeners. Welcome to episode 15 of our advanced English podcast here at High Level Listening. Today, we're going to chat about describing your children. We'll focus on how we talk about our kids, describing their personalities, their interests in both American and British English. Hi, everyone. I'm Kat, a teacher from the United States, ready to share my American insights when talking about kids and children. And my name is Mark. I'm a teacher from the UK. So we're here to give you a side by side look at children in British English and American English from both our perspectives. If you'd like to take your studying to the next level, we offer PDF transcripts exclusively for high level listening members. You can join us in the memberships tab on YouTube and click join as a high level listener. Then you can follow along word for word with every podcast episode. In this episode, as usual, we'll each read a script about today's topic, describing your kids, talking about your children. My script will naturally lean towards the American style with vocabulary and expressions, while Mark's will feature more British exp expressions and nuances. Afterwards, we'll go through some of the key vocabulary and phrases. We'll explain them. We'll give you some examples and then give you some great new language to help you talk about your own children in conversational high level English. So I'll start by asking Kat the first question. How would you describe your children? My kids are such characters. They're always making me laugh. My oldest, Ellen, is a natural born athlete. She's always out playing basketball or soccer with her friends. My youngest daughter, Emily, is kind of more of an artist, fashionista, stylist. She has a really good eye for fashion and is always involved in some art project or another at school. For the most part, they get along with each other. I'm, I mean, there's always going to be a spat or two with two teenage daughters in the house, but I think they do okay. Honestly, both, both of them are pretty outgoing and run in their own friend circles, which I think is great. School-wise, I wish they'd spend a bit more time doing their homework, but at the end of the day, I am very proud of the women they are becoming. All right, Mark, similarly, how would you describe your children? My kids are quite the lively duo. Harry, my eldest, is absolutely sports mad, always kicking a football or swinging a cricket bat. And then there's Sophie, my little artist. She's got a real knack for drawing and she loves her drama classes at school. They put up with each other most of the time, although obviously they fall out over silly little things every now and again. But they quickly get over it and are back to normal after a day or two. They're both quite sociable, so they're always bringing friends home with them after school, so sometimes the house is a bit manic. If they spent a little more time on their studies, I would be a tad happier, but as they're not struggling in any subjects, I suppose I haven't got much to grumble about. Grumble, 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 Dad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. We'll talk about <laughs> grumbling and understated <laughs> Britishness later on. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Good. I'm not allowed to be too happy because I'm British. <laughs> so, like usual, we'll go through our scripts now. We'll pick out any interesting, useful, or unique expressions to American English or British English and give you some more examples and a deeper explanation. So, Kat, what are your kids like? My kids are such characters. They're always making me laugh. Now, I guess the first thing that we can go over, should we be using the word child, children, kid, kids? You can absolutely use any of them. I would say kids is probably a more easygoing way to say children. And don't forget that child, child has that long I and ch, children has a short I sound and that dr that's kind of a little difficult. Children. Children. But kid and kids, those are so easy to say. So you might opt for those anyway. So my kids are such characters. Okay. 
if someone is a character or they are characters, that means that they're interesting, fun, or lively, or someone that is very memorable. Now, we can use this in a positive way or in a sarcastic kind of negative way. Of course, with my own kids, I'm trying to be nice about my own children. So they are such characters, okay? They are such characters. They're always making me laugh. Definitely a positive trait for them. However, if I'm trying to be maybe on the polite side, and I don't really like someone's uncle, per se, and I say, oh, your uncle, he's um, quite the character. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so that's more <laughs> of being sarcastic. It's kind of a way of saying, oh, well, I remember him, but not for good reasons. So that could be also a little bit of a negative side. I'm definitely using this in a positive way. They're always making me laugh. They're always making me laugh. They're such characters. So silly. So silly. Now, what about you, Mark? What are your kids like? My kids are quite the lively duo. So I'm going to break the phrase down into pieces. The first word is duo. A duo is two. A pair, a duo. So maybe you heard from the script, I have two kids. So together they are a duo. Lively means fun, energetic. They like to talk. Maybe they like to play sports. They're always doing something. They're never just being quiet and uh, sitting in their room reading. They're being lively. They're going out and doing things or making noise, as kids like to do. So if I've got a lively duo, I have two energetic children. I have two kids that are always up to something or always doing something. As part of the phrase, quite the lively duo. Sometimes you'll say, my kids but you can say the kids. And when you say the kids, I understand you're talking about just your children, just the kids in your house. So my kids or the kids are both fine. I take my kids to school. I take the kids to school mm, is the mm -hmm. same meaning. So I'm using the in this phrase. They're quite the lively duo. Uh, you can change the phrase too. They're quite the chatty duo they like to talk or they're quite the funny duo so yeah duo is good if you've got two kids yeah two kids or like two friends or two you know teammates i definitely would use this for also in american english for any kind of fun pair of kids maybe it could be yo oh, they're such a fun duo even a couple even a couple um, if they are romantically involved as well. They're just a really lively duo. They're both so fun and they go back and forth chatting and things like that. I quite like that phrase as well. Mm. Yeah, you even hear like a comedy duo if it's two comedians. Or yes, two exactly. Mm -hmm. Duo, a magic duo, two magicians, something like that. And for, yeah. for music, we use a duet with two people singing. So duo and duet, yes, two. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's go on through the script. Your oldest child, what is your oldest child interested in? Now, I did want to mention, uh, I get this question a lot. Um, is it oldest or eldest? And for me, I would definitely say both. I naturally say the oldest. Like, I'm the oldest child it, amongst my brothers and sisters. I'm the oldest. Would I say I'm the eldest? Mm, not really. I definitely hear it, but which one would you use, Mark? Oldest or eldest? Again, I also hear both in the UK. Mm -hmm. You might be more likely to hear eldest mm -hmm. in the UK. I can hear more British friends or people I know saying it. So my eldest or she is my eldest. In my script, I said Harry, my eldest. Mm -hmm. So you could also say Harry, my oldest. Right. Oldest, eldest has exactly the same meaning. So you can choose which one you prefer. I think I guess it gets a little bit confusing because we do talk about our children in kind of the ranking of birth. So it's like my youngest 
is the youngest child. Uh, maybe they're five years old. The middle child, if you have three, somewhere in the middle. And then the oldest would be the oldest child. And so that's how we often refer to them. And then if you're talking about your elders, those are older people in age, maybe 60, 70 years old, your elders. And so it does it does get a little confusing uh, when we're talking about that. But yeah, we kind of rank our children usually by age. <laughs> so my oldest, Ellen, is a natural born athlete. She's always out playing basketball or soccer with her friends. So we have a phrase here, my oldest, a natural born athlete and always out playing. So I'm going to look at these three phrases. A natural born something, a natural born person. What does that mean? That kind of means someone who is just very good at something. And I mean, naturally or innately. So it's almost like they don't have to work very hard. They are naturally good at something. So you are naturally gifted. You are a natural born athlete. We can use this with a natural born leader, a natural born artist, a natural born musician. They just picked up the violin, started playing so easily, didn't even have to work very hard at it. That would be a natural born artist, a natural born musician. So a great way to talk about our kids are what they are good at. OK, a natural born athlete. That would be my daughter for sure. Now, um, I. I like this. She's always out playing basketball. I even said earlier, they're always making me laugh. Now, I have studied other languages, and sometimes people don't like to use the word always because they think it means 100% of the time. And yes, that is what we're taught when we learn about this word in English. But I think we overuse it. I think we are, we're always using always in English. So I think we overuse this word to naturally mean very often. So instead of saying something like, um, she's often out playing basketball, kind of more naturally, I would say, oh, she's always out playing basketball. Meaning, you know, she often does these things. Oh, she's always doing this. She's always doing that. I think that means that it's part of her personality. It's part of her character. It's part of her routine. Oh, she's always doing this, always doing that. So we definitely overuse this word in English, but it does make it sound a little bit more easygoing than she often is out playing. She is, she's usually out playing. Those feel a little rigid, but she's always out doing this. Feels a bit more conversational. Yeah, I think that structure puts a lot of emphasis on how often they do it. They do it yeah. a lot. Like mm -hmm. he always listens to rock music mm -hmm. sounds fine but he's always listening to rock music <laughs> that sounds like it's actually kind of annoying like i can mm. hear music through his wall he's mm -hmm. playing music in the morning in the afternoon at night and like i can't stand it he's always listening to rock or he's always talking about cryptocurrency you can emphasize it so it actually sounds kind of negative and it's yeah. maybe a bit annoying. I um I I definitely think oh she's always out playing soccer. Mom, I only play soccer like two or three times a week. I know you're always out playing soccer. I never see you, you know? And so that might just emphasize that yes, you are doing something a lot. Whether it's positive or in Mark's case, he can grumble 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 and make it negative. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. My kids are always playing on their phones. Always on their phones. Always playing. Like it's the only thing they do and it's <laughs> bad for them. So, yeah, you can complain about your kids using that structure. Or you uh, can be excited about your kids, too, says the positive American. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> sure. um, All right. So what is your oldest child interested in? Harry, my eldest, is absolutely sports mad always kicking a football or swinging a cricket bat with his friends. So we talked about this earlier. My eldest. Mm -hmm. um, eldest is only used with people. I wouldn't say that about a building or a place or anything. He is my eldest. He's the eldest. You can introduce your children that way. 
Lucy is my eldest, Sam is my eldest, or parents love to show pictures, so like, oh look, here's a picture of my eldest. Um, my eldest, Harry, is sports mad. So if you're mad about something, in this case, it means that you love it and you're really passionate uh, about it. Uh -huh. This one it's feels quite British. This this feels quite British. Mm. Yeah, I'm um, sports mad. He is sports mad. So he loves watching it, playing it, reading about it, watching videos online about it. Do you think uh, if does. you're sports mad, you might be a bit obsessed with something? Yeah, obsessed has a slightly negative feeling to it. Mm -hmm. Sports mad is more positive. That's so, so funny. Mm -hmm. Right, I, like, I want to encourage this. If he's ah, sports mad, okay. great. You know, he can have posters on the wall. We can go to football matches or cricket games or whatever. Like, well, I'll encourage this. We might say sports crazy. Yeah, I think that mm. that definitely would be something similar. And crazy and mad sound like they're going to be bad words, but they're both positive. Yeah, just mm. going a little crazy on it, being a little obsessed with it, I think is actually kind of fun. Sure. Yeah, the, the easy thing is that you can just put the topic before mad. So mm. he's sports mad. She's Harry Potter mad. Oh, yeah. That means that she reads all the books. She watches all the films. She's got posters, uh, everything else. Uh, she's K-pop mad. Like, <laughs> right. she loves K-pop. Any hobby or activity that your child is interested in. And kids have a lot of energy and they get really, really, really invested Excited. in Excited, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? They are mad. Sports mad. Yeah. Uh, K-pop mad. Whatever. Whatever hobby they have, would you, they can be mad. Would you say they're mad about something? Crazy about something? Yeah, sure. That would have the same meaning. Like He's okay. mad about Pokemon. Or yeah, he's <laughs> mad about video uh -huh. games. He's crazy and about Fortnite. You'd think it sounds like angry, but it's, oh, he's mad. He's just like, <laughs> he's football mad, <laughs> sports mm. mad. Right. But this means they, they love it. They absolutely love it. Okay. Uh, so we've talked about the oldest or the eldest. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the other child. What is your youngest child interested in? Now, I just have two. So I have my oldest and my youngest. Now, because they're both my daughters, it, it is easier for me to say my oldest or my youngest. Um, when you have kind of a boy or a girl, if you're introducing them, oh, this is my oldest, he's blah, blah, blah. This is my youngest. But after that, like my son, my daughter, um, we don't always, because they are different sexes, we don't actually really, I don't think we really need to let everybody know my oldest son. Because there's no other son. <laughs> so um, we could say mm. my oldest kid or my oldest child uh, would make sense. And so for my daughters, in order to tell them apart, my oldest daughter, my youngest daughter, because they're the same. They have the, So my youngest daughter, Emily, is kind of more of an artist, fashionista, stylist. She's just a mix of these things. She has a really good eye for fashion and is always involved in some sort of art project or another at school. So we've got some really good phrases here. Now, uh, we've noticed that in the comments, we've gotten a few questions about this phrase, kind of, kind of. Yes, we use it a lot, especially in American English. Now, in this case, kind of is acting like a filler. You know, my daughter, she's kind of, uh, you know, she's more like, mm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right words to say. Or because my daughter is so many different things. Oh, you know, she's kind of, uh, she's like this. Uh, and she's, a, she might be more like that. She's kind of, yeah, she's, okay. Now I have confidence. Ah, she's a, here we go. Um, she's an artist, fashionista, stylist. Okay, so I can use this kind of, uh, you know, she might be a little bit like this, a little bit like that. So as I'm collecting myself, it is a good filler word to use. And you'll hear it quite often with people who are collecting their thoughts. 
Um, instead of saying like she's a, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, you could, silent sounds weird. Yeah. Uh huh. So, uh, kinda. Uh, <laughs> So instead of the ums and the ahs, we might use kind of, and and you can hear it, kind of. I'm trying to fill the silence a little bit. So we have a couple of words here, an artist, a stylist, person who styles someone, gives them uh, the right outfit, the good pieces that match together, an artist who might paint or draw. And a fashionista. A fashionista is someone who loves fashion and loves fashion trends. Now, my sister is a fast fashionista. Uh, she's always stylish, always fashionable. Now, the last one is a great one. She has a really good eye for something. She has a good eye for design. I think of this one as, you know, you are kind of, <laughs> um, you know, someone that has really good sense of style. So she has a really good eye for furniture. She has a really good eye for photography. You kind of, that means that when you can look at something, you can imagine the big picture furniture, antiques, fashion, design. You have a good eye, a good eye. That means you can look at something and see how it fits together somewhere. So definitely my daughter has a really good eye for, what does she have a really good eye for? Fashion? Fashion. <laughs> In this case. <laughs> In this case, right. yes. So sure. yeah, anything that's visually appealing or if you're yes. very good at artistic things, creative things, even if it's like decorating a room or putting furniture in the right place, mm -hmm. you have a good eye for that. You're good yes. at making things look nice. That's a good way. That's a good, simple way of putting. Yes. All right. So what about your youngest? And then there's my Sophie, my little artist. She's got a real knack for drawing and loves her drama classes at school. So when you talk to children and you talk about children, there are certain phrases that you can use just for kids, but not for adults or teenagers, really. Mm. One of those phrases is my little artist. So, yeah, if you I wouldn't recommend saying this to a teenager and I wouldn't say this to another adult, but mm. to a child that's maybe like 12, 11 or younger, you can say, oh, yeah, she's my little artist. Mm -hmm. or my little and then the role or the job that they're interested in. So my daughter, Sophie, is very good at art and very passionate about art. So she's my little artist. If she was interested in sports, I'd say my little athlete, like she's good at sports or she really enjoys sports. Or if she enjoys writing, she would be my little writer. So I'm saying like, this because aw, I'm Like, oh, how cute. Look, you're being, you're doing an adult job, but you're just a little one, right? <laughs> yes, <So>. right. <laughs> yeah, you could say this about your pets as well. Uh, but yeah, with <laughs> young kids, yeah, I'm, I'm talking proudly. I'm not making fun of them. I'm not being sarcastic uh, because I'm talking about a young child. So if I'm proud of them, then yeah, she's my little artist. Or if I'm proud of her writing ability then, yeah, she's my little writer. So I've, this is I've coming from like a proud place. Definitely. And like you said, coming from a proud place, like mommy's little writer, daddy's little sports player, especially for babies and toddlers, even if they haven't actually chosen any um, jobs or sports or anything, you might see daddy's little soccer player or daddy's little football player. And it just means that they might grow up to be this job or might grow up to do or like this thing. That's very common, especially for babies, toddlers, and really young kids. Mm. Yeah, so uh, earlier Kat said that her eldest daughter was a natural athlete. Mm. Uh, here, I said, Sophie's got a real knack for Ooh. drawing. Great phrase. So, 
Yeah, the word knack has one of those silent K's, like mm -hmm. knee, a knife. Knack starts with a K. And if you have a knack for something, again, you're naturally good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You pick it up or you do well quickly without a lot of practice or without much training. So she's got a real knack for drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got a real knack for photography. She's got a real knack for writing. That means she's really good. She's naturally good at writing. Uh, he's got a real knack for photography. His photos are great. Even on a simple, cheap camera with no training, uh, he's good at it. So she's got a real knack for it. He's got a real knack for it. They've got mm. a real talent for it. They're good at it. I would definitely. I, I really think that a lot of people like to use that phrase in American English as well. Oh, yeah, he's got a real knack for that. Um, and mm -hmm. especially if we're looking at our kids and, you know, we want to support the things that they're good at and introduce them to things. Uh, your teacher or other parents might say, oh, wow, they've got a real knack for that. They're they're actually pretty good at that very naturally. Mm -hmm. OK, so you've got two daughters. Do they <laughs> always get along? Mm -hmm. Do they always get along? Hmm, good question. For the most part, they get along with each other. I mean, there's always going to be a spat or two with teenage daughters in the house, but I think they do okay. So we have lots of phrases here. For the most part. For the most part. I would say that maybe more than 80%, more than 80%, quite quite often, for the most part. Um, more often than not is another good phrase. More often than not. So 60% of the time, <laughs> they get along with each other. If you get along with someone, you are both very positive towards each other. Uh, if you get along with someone, then you might have something in common. You're happy. They're happy. We're getting along. Getting along. We often talk about this with uh, brothers and sisters, uh, sisters, brothers. Are they getting along? Because we have to all live together. You know, it's not like we just get to choose our family, choose our brothers and sisters. So it's nice if we could all could we all just get along, please? Could we all um, stop saying mean things to annoy your brother? Can you stop hitting your sister? Can you stop screaming and running around to annoy everyone? Let's all just get along. Can we just get along with each other, please? And if they, if they don't get along, then they fight. They argue yes. or they mm -hmm. quarrel with each other a lot. So you want them to get along for peace and quiet mm -hmm, and calm mm -hmm. in your house. Yes, um, especially if they don't get along for a very long time, then they can start to really dislike each other. It's OK if you don't get along every single moment of the day. Of course, you're not going to always agree. Of course, you know, you're not always going to get along. But it would be nice if for the most part you could get along. Because like Mark said, if you don't get along, there might be an argument. There might be a fight. You might get so angry at each other. But this one here, there's always going to be a spat or two. A spat, S-P-A-T, a spat is like a little argument. Um, I would say a fight would probably be, I mean, we don't have to physically hit each other for a fight. It could just be that we are arguing, yelling at each other. That's a fight. A spat is uh, a little bit more than a disagreement, okay? No, you can't take my clothes. Oh, come on, please, can I take your clothes? That's just a disagreement. A spat might be, why are you taking my clothes? Get out of my room. Just leave. Just go. And then a fight might be, did I tell them you took my clothes? So there are different levels of a disagreement, a spat, and then a full-on fight, okay? So all the parents out there know that there are all different levels of fighting in the house, <laughs> but hopefully for the most part, they get along with each other. Right. I imagine a spat is just with words. There's no mm. physical 
touching or pushing, right? A spat. Or yelling. Yelling at each other. I don't think there's really too much yelling in a spat. I think it's, you know, you're you're getting louder, getting a little bit louder, but hopefully no yelling and definitely no physical fighting. Mm. Yes. Okay. Uh, With my kids, they put up with each other most of the time. Although obviously they fall out over silly little things every now and again, but they quickly get over it and go back to normal in a few days. So Kat said, get along. I said, to put up with. (laughs) Mm -hmm. They put up with each other. Mm. Uh, Get along sounds like they have a good relationship. Put up with sounds Mm. like they tolerate each other because they have to. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe they're not really good friends, but they're brother and sister. They live in the same house. It is easier to not fight than to fight every single day. Right, so right. they just put up with it. All children want more privacy. Uh, when there's snacks or dessert, they want more food or they want more time to take a shower in the morning. Um, so they, they're sibling their sister or brother might get in the way of that and make them annoyed or make them angry but you don't fight about it because you would have to do that every single day it's easier every moment of every day (laughs) exactly so they might be annoyed but it's easier to just put up with it and don't fight just get through the day um adults will say this too if you have an annoying or strange colleague at work Mm. Uh, You don't like them, but you don't say anything rude or bad about them. Mm. Just put up with them, get to five o'clock and then go home. That's easier than disagreeing with them, arguing with them or fighting back with them. Just put up with it. Um, Yes, we've talked about fighting. Uh, If your children argue with each other and then I think I'm right and she thinks she's right, and we don't talk to each other, we fall out. So sometimes they fall out over silly little things. They might fall out about sharing the TV or stealing the iPad charger, or maybe someone took the last cookie from the fridge and then they argue about that and they fall out and they don't talk to each other for a couple of hours. But after a couple of hours, they get over it, they calm down, They forget about the argument and go back to normal. So they fall out, they get over it, and they're friendly again. So this is the natural cycle of siblings. (laughs) When when my brother and I, I don't know why, we fought all the time. I think it's because we're so similar. We fought all the time. And my dad would say, build a bridge and get over it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, right. Here's a hammer. And we would just... Oh, dad. Oh, my gosh, dad. Build a bridge and get over it. Stop it. So I think then we would get annoyed at dad and we would stop getting annoyed at each other. So we would shut up, stop talking and 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 just be annoyed at our dad after that. Nice, smart, good diplomatic move. Yeah, Yeah. luckily, me and my sister got along quite well. We still Mm -hmm. get along very well now as adults. Yeah. Yeah, I feel quite lucky there. We didn't really fall out much. Right. So uh, back to your children here. Do they have a lot of friends? Honestly, both of them are pretty outgoing and run in their own friend circles, which I think is great. So uh, in American English, we love the word pretty. Pretty outgoing. Pretty outgoing. Now, in this case, that means quite, quite outgoing. Yeah, they're pretty outgoing. They're not really outgoing, but somewhere between quite and really outgoing. Yeah, they're pretty outgoing. And they run in their own friend circles. Okay, so a friend circle is are all the people that you know, okay? So I, I don't know why we think of it as a circle, but it is our, kind of our group of friends, our group of friends. So you might have two different friend circles. So I go to uh, play sports and I have a friend circle there. We're all kind of friends. We all know each other. But then when I'm going to the art class 
that's a completely different friend circle. And these friend circles don't really know each other because we don't run in the same circles. There's nothing to connect us here. Maybe what connects us is school. So the art circle of friends and the sports circle of friends, yes, could overlap a little bit. But I would think of your different groups of friends, not quite cliques, um, C-L-I-Q-U-E-S, not quite cliques, because I think of those as kind of the stereotypical groups, but simply your groups of friends, one that you know from here, one that you know from there. So they both run in their own friend circles. So that kind of means that she has her friends, she has her friends. They don't really know each other. They don't really know each other, which would make sense because one daughter is older and the youngest one is younger. So that would make sense. It also what be about quite you? Tricky to, yeah. Sorry to mix circles. Sometimes if you have two groups of friends and you want to introduce them to each other, you have to mm. mix circles and sometimes it works and it becomes a bigger circle. Uh, mm -hmm. sometimes they don't get along and they stay separate. And they just go back yeah. to being kind of their natural circles, isn't it? Yeah, that is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. uh, what about your kids? Do they have a lot of friends? They're both quite sociable, so they're always bringing friends home with them after school. So in Cat's script, she said pretty outgoing. Pretty, you can also say in the UK, it's less common. Uh, that's why I said quite Mm -hmm. Quite, I said quite sociable instead of pretty sociable, but they would both be correct. Sociable means that they like talking to people. They like talking. They like uh, social things like team sports, going to parties or get togethers. Yeah, they enjoy being sociable. You can just say they're both quite social. They're both quite sociable. I think those words have the same meaning. So they're always bringing friends home with them. Maybe school is finished and they say, hey, do you want to come over? And sure. And then when I come home after work, there are like four kids in my house. Two of them are mine and then they brought some of their friends with them. So sometimes the house is a bit manic. Manic, like busy or loud or crazy because they've opened the fridge, they're eating snacks, they're sitting on the sofa, they've made a big mess. It's all part of just having kids and their friends come over and have fun together. So with your children, how are they doing in school? School-wise, um, I wish they'd spend a bit more time doing their homework, honestly. Um, I like this word school-wise. When we are when we add in wise at the end of a word, so we've got words like work wise, weather wise, money wise, health wise, that means we're introducing a topic. Okay, so school wise, when talking about school or on the topic of school or in regards to school, that means I'm kind of introducing a new topic. OK, so in my script, I had said something about their friends group and then I, w I just added in at the bottom school wise. I wish they'd spend a bit more time doing their homework. So that means that I'm kind of shifting topics a little bit. School wise, things are good. Work wise, things are good. For on this topic, school, things are good. On this topic of work, things are good. I wish they would. I wish they would. I wish they'd. Apostrophe D, that's probably why it's so difficult to hear it. I wish they'd spend more time. I wish they would spend more time or a bit more time. That means I'm hoping for something in the future, but it's maybe it'll happen, maybe not. Ugh, I wish I, I wish I would do something else. I'm not sure of a good example. <laughs> I wish they'd stop fighting. I wish they'd be quiet. That means that it might happen, it might not, but that's what I want for the future. That's what I want for the future. Wish yes, they'd wanna... do this. I'm trying to change my reality. That's how I describe the second mm. conditional. Not to get too grammary, but yeah, if I want to change 
my reality, change the present, like change my kid's behavior, I wish they would go to bed earlier, or I wish they would stop looking at their phone during dinner time. So yeah, if you want to change or imagine changing your kid's behavior, I wish they would、mm. do something differently. Yes. And what about you?、Uh, how are they doing in school? If they spent a little more time on their studies, I would be a tad happier. But as they're not struggling in any subjects, I suppose I haven't got much to grumble about. So I'm using the second conditional again. So I'm trying to change the reality. If they spent a little more time on their studies, I would be a tad happier. A tad, I think, is a more British phrase. Right? Do you say a、yeah. tad?、Yeah. Um, I say it sometimes. Like a tad. Could you turn it up a tad? A bit.、Right. Turn it up a bit. Tad louder. Tad lower. Tad closer. Sure. So a tad is a little, a little closer, a tad closer. Or if they spent a little more time on their studies, I would be a little happier. I would be a tad happier. So yeah, people might say、uh, it's a tad difficult to remember. Uh, the grammar, or it's a tad expensive, or I would be a tad happier. It would be a tad better with、mm. some salt. <laughs> so tad just means a little. And the best phrase in this sentence is, "I haven't got much to grumble about." <laughs> grumble,、yeah. grumble, grumble. Grumble. Yeah, to grumble is to complain. Uh, so if you grumble about. Something you complain about something, so it's got the same preposition. Maybe my son often grumbles about his homework because he doesn't want to do it. Homework is boring and it's difficult. He's yeah. Or my、stop、daughter grumbling. grumbles. Yeah, right. As a parent, stop grumbling and tidy、what's, your room. What's what's the difference between grumbling and mumbling? Oh, uh, yeah, mumbling. Is how you talk. Mumbling is saying something very quietly, and it's actually quite difficult to hear someone who's mumbling. Maybe someone's nervous or embarrassed, so they mumble and they don't talk very clearly. You know, sorry, what did you say? I, you're mumbling. Grumbling is like grr, angry, grumble, complain. So angry maybe, mumbles, maybe angry mumbles, grumbles. <laughs> Oh yeah, fair enough. It's like that. Yeah,、mm-hmm. it's a combo.、Uh, but yes. So as a parent, I have two kids who get along most of the time. They put up with each other. They've both got friends.、Um, they both they both have a, an interest or hobby like sports and art. So I haven't got much to grumble about. They also do quite well at school. So I haven't got much to grumble about. I have nothing to complain about. And this is very high praise. From a British person, and we'll talk about this in a second.、Uh, in your case, are you proud of your two girls? Of course.、Um, in the end, I'm very proud of the women they're becoming. So when I say in the end, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'm very proud of the women they're becoming. So right before this, I said something maybe a little negative. I said, "School-wise, I wish they'd spend a bit more time doing their homework." That is a complaint from me. They don't do enough homework. They don't spend enough time on their homework. But at the end of the day, in the end, overall, despite all that, even though what I said before is a little negative, I'm actually very happy. I'm very proud of the women that they are becoming. So、um, I like this phrase: "At the end of the day, in the end,、uh, despite what I said that was negative, I actually feel very positive." So that's just kind of a nice way to sort of wrap everything up. So you know, at the end of the day, the little things don't matter, and I'm very happy to be their mom. You know, at the end of the day, I might com- you know complain. Now, this doesn't mean at the end of the day, literally. It means kind of at the end of everything I'm saying.、Um, hmm. Overall, to sum up,、finally. to sum up everything, despite those little bit negative things, they don't really matter in the end, do they? So, in the end, 
everything that I said before, forget it. I'm actually very proud of the women that they're becoming. Right. Like maybe we went on holiday. It rained every day. The hotel and the food was expensive. But at the end of the day, we still had a good time. So despite the negative things, sometimes overall, it was still good. Overall, that was the thumbs up. <laughs> feeling. Yeah, right. So yeah, one final cultural note. Again, I haven't got much to grumble about. Uh, British people <laughs> often use something called understatements or mm. understating. It's the opposite of exaggerating. If mm. a food is nice and you say, oh, this is awesome, that's exaggerating. That's so American. I feel like this is the right. difference between Americans exaggerating, over-exaggerating, and Brits are under, under uh, understating. Yes, that's right. very so true. Overstating is being super enthusiastic, super passionate. And then I think in the UK, we like to do the opposite thing, understating. So when something is really good, we will understate it and say, yeah, it was quite nice. Or if it's 40 degrees Celsius outside, we'd be like, oh yeah, it's not cold. Huh. Um, we will understate it and make everything smaller. And we can use some of the vocab we've seen here too. So if my two kids just had a fight, we will understate it and say, yeah, they had uh, a bit of a spat this morning. Or if your son brings home a friend and he's quite strange, let's say, you can say, yeah, he's a, he's an interesting young man. He's an interesting mm. kid. Or he's a bit of a character. That's understatement too. And in my case, both my kids are great. I don't have much to grumble about. That is a massive understatement. So if a British person doesn't seem very enthusiastic. Very enthusiastic, yeah. Praise, right. They, they probably are, really. Inside, they actually are. But... It's a cultural thing where we just don't exaggerate that much. We leave that I, to the Americans. Over yeah. There. And I would say, you know, some people are like, oh, I met this American girl and she seems so excited to go do this, but now she's not going to do it. And I was like, yeah, that uh, sounds right. I think we, right. we want to be overly positive to be polite, but maybe we're not actually that enthusiastic about something. So some people think that that's a fake characteristic about Americans. And I think that if you're if Brits are going to grumble about things, that they're always unhappy with things, but they're actually quite delighted by certain things. And it's a little confusing, even for me as an American. And we speak the same language. Mm. Yeah, there you go. So, well, thank you for studying with us in this super long episode super long enjoyed it <laughs> yes there's so much to talk about on this topic uh like always though there will be a pdf transcript of everything we've said which you can download if you are a member and you can download if you become a member using the join button below and uh, if you have any questions about the language we used or if you want to tell us about your kids what are they like what do they do what are they good at write us a message in the comments below as well Thank you so much, everyone. And we hope that you have a wonderful day with your kids. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.